Hello and welcome. This is the Paul Ryder Tapes. I'm Angela Smith. I'm the ex-wife of Paul Ryder. As everybody knows, he passed away tragically in July of 2022. But in the months leading up to his death, he sat down with me and we spent hours and hours recording his life story. We had no idea that he was going to die so soon and literally we finished recording this podcast 12 days before he died. Coming up in this episode... It must have been a Thursday night, eight years old, and David Bowie comes on doing Starman with a big blue acoustic guitar. I'd never seen a blue guitar before in my life. And then he looked like he'd stepped out of another world. And it was like my life changed at that moment. We were watching the gig at the arena and then all of a sudden I said to you, oh, it's raining in. Yeah. And it wasn't raining in. It was something very nasty. Yeah. What? Well, we were down below and it's somebody up above. Couldn't be bothered going to the toilet. Go to the toilet. He's got a shiver down my spine there. He's fucking here, isn't he? Yeah, of course he is. Oh, oh, just got all really cold shivers. Oh, that's fucking weird. Really? Ooh. (laughs) (laughs) Right, go on, (laughs) start. Getting grilled off my (laughs) ex-wife for a podcast. Okay, are we ready? Are we recording already? Okay. <laughs> we don't need... Do we need a disclaimer at the beginning? We don't, do we? Are we going to be talking about, like... Are we going to be using naughty words and talking about sex? Because if so, we have to do a disclaimer. Should we just do one anyway, just do in case? Do one, because I'm a swearer. All right, so, um, warning. This podcast may um, involve some naughty words... And maybe some talk about drugs, maybe some graphic talk about drug use, and maybe a bit of sex, actually. Let's be honest. I mean, come on, you've not led exactly um, a monk-style life, have you? So, okay, (laughs) warning, this podcast might not be suitable for everybody. And I find, actually, when we do announcements like that at the beginning, it means more people want to listen anyway. (laughs) Oh, that sounds good. But I'm I'm definitely a swearer, so I'm glad you've done a disclaimer. All right, brilliant. So, welcome to the Paul Ryder podcast. Hi. Um, No, no, I wasn't saying welcome to you, I was saying welcome to the listeners. Oh, welcome, welcome (laughs) listeners. So, this is the Paul Ryder podcast um, with Paul Ryder, who is the bass player of the Happy Mondays. I said that wrong because it's not the Happy Mondays, is it? It's just Happy Mondays. It's just Happy Mondays. Yes. And me, Angela Smith, who's actually the ex-wife of said Paul Ryder bass player of the Happy Mondays, of the Happy Mondays. Um, And the reason that we're doing this is because Paul, for a long, long time, has been saying, I need to write a book, I need to write a book, I need to write a book. Um, But he doesn't actually like writing. So I suggested that instead of him actually writing a book, he could talk a book in a podcast. Mm -hmm. And he said, yeah, but you'll have to ask me questions. I was like, right, well, I can do that. So that's why we're here. Mm -hmm. So what is it that makes you feel like you need to write a book? Mm, Well, there's been a lot of um, rumours, exaggeration, stuff that's been made up. Um, there's a lot of stuff to put right. Okay. And I think it's time. Time to set the record yeah. straight. Like one big thing is that we didn't send factory records under. The Mondays never did that. Factory went bust owing us nearly a million pounds. Really? I never knew that. Yeah, 800,000. Really? Well, we'll get to that. Yeah. Later on, because I think what we're going to do is talk chronologically from okay. the very beginning. We want all the details, all the micro details of your life and mm-hmm. the story and the real truth about the story of the Mondays, what really happened, who the characters in the Mondays really are mm-hmm. and all those legends and myths that people have seen in movies. We want to know which bits are true and which aren't because we know that a lot of it's based on truth yeah. but there's also some exaggeration. A lot of exaggeration. So this is really where you're going to get the real truth Mm -hmm. about the story of the Happy Mondays. Yeah, if you want to know the truth, keep listening. 
We're going to be talking about some sensitive topics. We're going to be talking about drug addiction. Mm -hmm. Paul's been very vocal about his struggle with addiction, and I have been at the sharp end of that. So oh, yes, you was. I know. Have I made amends for that yet? I don't think you've fully made amends. <laughs> Do you think you ever can? <laughs> um, so we're going to be talking about drug addiction. We're going to be talking about all the various ways and things you did to try and combat your drug addiction. Mm -hmm. um, we're going to be talking about infidelity. Oh. <laughs> this is re <laughs> this is revenge time for me, isn't it? <laughs> um, we're going to be talking about children. We're going to be talking about um, our son who had cancer mm -hmm. um, and had an extraordinary journey with that. <laughs> but really more than anything else, we're going to be talking about the Happy Mondays. And, uh, you did it again, you said that. I know, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. It's just, it's a really hard word. It's ha a hard name to not put a the in front of, mm, isn't it? Yeah. I've always thought that. Yeah. You can say that if you want, I don't mind. Okay. In fact, we're, we're, we're going to jump to, we will go to the very beginning in a second, but um, there's been a huge legal battle over who owns owns the name and who came up with the name and mm -hmm. lots of people have different opinions about that so do you want to start off by absolutely putting the record straight about who came up with the name and what okay happened? i came up with the name <laughs> me uh, and it came about through an echo in the bunnyman song the cutter there's a line in there that says by the happy loss and we was called the happy loss for like four days. I never knew that. Yeah. It's, but we kept the word happy and for some reason I changed it to Mondays. Instead of the happy loss, it became happy Mondays. And is that like a nod and a wink to the fact that you don't have to do a, a boring day job so that you don't dread Monday anymore? Oh, I never thought it'd be like that. Really, all these years, that's yeah. what, why I thought the band was called that, because suddenly yeah. you get to be happy on a Monday. It's all down to Ian McCulloch. I love I Ian blame, McCulloch. I blame Ian McCulloch. I've been playing the Echo and the Bunnymen on repeat for yeah. the last three months when I drive. It's weird. I've love the Bunnymen. I've really discovered them again. Loved, I saw them last year. They was playing the same festival as the Mondays. Yeah. And, um, it was great. I stood at the side of the stage and, and watched the Bunnymen. Nice. Incredible. Yeah, Ian yeah, McCulloch's yeah. still got it. Yeah, hasn't Gaz it? said to him, best band in the world, and McCulloch turned around and said, I know. Did he? <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah. that's cool. That's cool. All right, so let's go right back to the very beginning. Mm -hmm. um, there have been lots of things written about you growing up homeless in Withenshaw and, <laughs> and various things. So you were born in 1964. Okay, you were born in 64. Mine's in Salford. Okay, what kind of house did you grow up in? It was... Um, there was houses that was built, made into an estate for the Salford slum clearance. Um, when it was clearing all the slums of Salford and putting people in council houses that was just be freshly been built in the late fifties. Mm -hmm. So it was a council estate and everybody had come from Salford at the middle of Salford to a place called Little Holton where it used to be farmland and they built all these huge estates for the uh, Salford overspill. And uh, my grandparents got a house there and I was born in that house on Coniston Avenue. You were actually born at home? Uh, uh, yeah. Was it, that like a planned house? Because that was pretty radical in those days yeah, to be born yeah. at home. Well, my mum had Sean at home as well, same house. We were both born in the same house. Why did she decide to have you at home? I have no idea, I don't know. We need to ask her, don't we? Need we need to ask her, yeah. Well, Make sure that's the first question. Well, in those days, they didn't let fathers at the birth. And Derek wanted to be there with both of them. And I absolutely horrified my mother. No, I'm not having that, she said, unless you come to my house and have them. So we had our own house near, in near Bolton. My mum lived in Little Holton at the time before she moved here. And uh, so nearly three weeks before they were both born, we went and stayed at my mother's so Derek could be at the birth of both of them. That's pretty radical, though, for, for the 60s, isn't it? Yeah. Like everyone else had babies in hospitals in those days. Yeah, you had to go into hospital, but um, I suppose it was pretty kind of uh, 
radical. Yeah. So you were you were living with your parents and your grandparents when you were born. Yes. Oh, I didn't know that. See, yeah. I'm learning things too. I really yeah. didn't know that. Right. Yeah. I'm okay. All on Coniston Avenue in the little three bedroom house. And was it a nice house? It was a lovely house, yeah, it was brand new. They'd just yeah. been built, they'd come out of the slums of Salford into this yeah. brand new house with a garden at the front and a garden at the back. Right. And it was, uh, and it had running hot water and a, with a bathroom. Wow. What's your earliest memory? I have an early memory of lying on the couch with my dad and I must have been five years old and we was watching Batman and Robin. We was watching <laughs> Batman. And after Batman had finished, um, it was the news, and the news played Penny Lane by the Beatles and shown a video, and I remember that. Wow. I remember seeing Penny Lane and, and Batman on the same night. Tell us a bit about your parents. Yeah. Back in uh, those days. Back in those days, my mum always worked as a infant school teacher for five-year-olds. She had, she, when he first got to school at, at, at the age of uh, four. four, five, she had she had the class for the uh, newcomers. Right. And she she went through a whole career doing that. So all through the days, the Mondays, all through you growing up, your mm -hmm. mum was working? She yeah? was working, yeah. Okay. A, and what about your dad? My dad, um, my grandfather got him a job on on the papers newspapers i think it was a daily express which was in ancoats in manchester so my dad was working there when i was born right yeah and then he went on to work at the post office is that right then he went yeah he had a couple of other jobs in between working at a print works um doing printing ink for the newspapers <laughs> but he eventually ended up at the uh at the post office when i was about eight nine mm -hmm. something like that mm -hmm. and he was there until the day we said to him pack your job in dan come with us yeah didn't he also have a fish and chip shop don't mention the chip shop anything that could go wrong did go wrong the first day in derek pulled the cash dryer and broke his foot the freezer broke so all the fish went bad <laughs> the woman gave us a number to phone if anything went wrong with the fridge. I phoned this number. Uh, the man had been dead five years that serviced it. It was, um, <laughs> it was an end terrace. The house was an end terrace, so there's a big gable end wall. People used to kick the ball at it. And uh, he looked out the window one day, so he was kicking the ball, and the ball went straight through and into glass <gasps> in his eyes and another disaster. Then, after that, uh, He'd not shut the door properly on the potato machine that peeled the potatoes and the door flew open, there was a big stone in that looked like a potato and hit Derek in the eye and he had a big black eye and a big bruise. And then he went out to, uh, one day he went out to do the potatoes to make them into chips and got stung by a wasp. <laughs> and collapsed on the floor and turned green. He was allergic to wasp things. Oh, wow. So uh, they just about got him to hospital in time before he died of uh, wow. before he died of a wasp thing. Wow. I think that was the final straw. He just like, wow. put it up for sale and like, yeah. that's when he went, that's when he went to the post office. Okay. After the fish and chips <laughs> ship, ship, ship shop. But Derek's life was, um, he didn't only have a regular job, did he? He mm. had, I think maybe you and your brother inherited your musical talent from yeah. your dad. Tell us about that. Well, he started off in folk folk bands, doing folk music in particular, um, folk club every Sunday night in in um, I think it was in the Stocks Hold the Stocks Pub in Walkden. They had a folk club every Sunday night, so he started off being in a folk band. Eventually, left that and formed a comedy duo with Barry. Barry Seddon, who was who was also in the folk band, so they went off and then ended up doing the working men's clubs yeah. for years, you know. So he, he 
the postman job was perfect for him. You know, he'd be finished by 12 in the afternoon. So he was he was singing and telling jokes at the same time kind of thing? Yeah, when they, when they uh, formed the comedy duo. <laughs> what was it called? Derek and Barry Harry, the non-identical twins. <laughs> Derek and Barry, who's Barry Harry? Bar- Barry's Barry Seddon. No. And who's Harry? That's just made up. Oh, OK. Yeah. And his favourite <laughs> joke was... Barry was the first test tube baby. His birth sign is Pyrex the dish. <laughs> <laughs> really? It's a terrible joke, but I love it. Are there any more? Oh, he's, I've got a CD's worth of jokes. Really? We had it transferred when he died. He got it transferred onto really? a desk. Yeah. Oh, there we go. One of his concerts. Oh, brilliant. I think it's a Lee Working Men's Club or something oh, like that. Oh, that'd be excellent. Oh, we need to... Maybe we can put a clip into this, actually. That yeah. That might be a good idea. That'd be Should good. Should we do that? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, let's do that. Yeah. Never mind Patrick Steptoe and all that crap in Oakland. Barry was the world's first test tube baby, 19 years ago. In fact, his birth sign is Pyrex the Dish. <laughs> 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 when the Mondays was taking off, he, my dad had to decide what he wanted to do, whether he was going to stick with Barry and do the working men's clubs or whether he was going to come with his two boys. And he came, he came with us and went on the journey with us. I mean, that was amazing. My first memory of my, the first time I met you, your dad was the tour manager and yeah. he was just this really cool guy with a really long ponytail That's at the back right. of his head but he was bald bald on top yeah yeah and he was only about five foot one wasn't he yeah yeah not a terribly big guy yeah but it it you always got the impression that he was like totally proud and totally in it in his element oh he was he loved it you. yeah he, he loved um he did something with my speakers and my ampeg cabs he took the speakers out that he came with and put jbl's in there so it sounded phenomenal. He was always doing little things like that yeah. to make to make us sound better. Yeah. Yeah. He was uh, he was a very proud man. Yeah. Yeah. Are you gonna cry? <laughs> <laughs> no, I love Dexy. He was he was. Yeah, it's cool. very small but very very strong, yeah. like Mighty Mouse. Yeah, and the, the the really cool thing about him was that. He really fitted in with the vibe of the band. It wasn't like your dad breathing down your neck. He was kind of one of the lads as well, wasn't he? He was one of the lads, yeah. And the crew adored him, didn't they? Yeah, yeah. Gaz says, Gaz Whelan says that he grew up, grew up with my dad more than he did with his dad. Right. He was he around was... At a critical age. Right. So he was Gaz, on the road with him. Yeah, so Gaz sees him as a, de- a father figure as well. Yeah. Or saw him as a father figure. Yeah. Gaz Whelan's the drummer of the Mondays and he's known Derek since he was 15. Oh, Derek did everything. If it wasn't for Derek, we wouldn't have, we wouldn't have done anything. He brought the PA in. When, he, when we got a proper crew and he got on board with the crew, he was, he was great, yeah. He was, but early on, he had to, you know, he was one in charge of everything, had to keep us in control, but, you know, and we used to make fun of him sometimes, and he used to just ignore us and go on a bit, but we, if it wasn't for him, we wouldn't have, we wouldn't have left the rehearsal room. We always, and I said, look, the, the, before he died, the last time I seen him, I went around and I said to him, you know, I just said, thanks, you know, without you, we wouldn't have, we wouldn't have got anywhere. What about this, I know he made a lot of sacrifices to actually get you to the point where you were a band that were, was often touring. Tell mm-hmm. me about that. Oh, my poor mum, she never got a built in wardrobes. Oh. All the money went on equipment for the band. <laughs> I always wanted fitted wardrobes. And every time we'd saved the money up for fitted wardrobes, Derek would buy some other equipment for them. And I had to wait till four years ago when I moved here to get me fitted wardrobes and they were already in the bungalow. <laughs> But I got them eventually, but then fitted wardrobes have gone out of fashion, haven't they? What, so everything he earned he put into the band for you and Sean? Yeah, he bought a PA system so we could be used properly. He bought me a bass uh, for my 21st birthday. It was either, do you want a party or do you want a bass guitar? And it was like, oh, bass guitar, definitely. You know, and he's... um, him and Phil Sachs, who was the Monday's first proper manager, um, they used to pay for our rehearsal rooms. 
Wow. Yeah, every week it would be one week it my dad would pay, next week Phil would pay. Which was great because we moved from rehearsing in a school in Swinton into a proper rehearsal room. Yeah. You know, where we could go and hang out all day. We'll be right back continuing the conversation after these quick few messages from our sponsors. From the same company that brought you this series, there are three new podcasts that we strongly recommend. The first one is a true crime series called Framed for Murder, the case of Matthew Turner. It's a really harrowing and quite intriguing true crime series about a guy who's now 32 years old and he spent the last 14 years in prison for a crime that all the evidence suggests he did not commit. The series, available as a podcast or on video, follows his legal team as they reinvestigate the case and fight for his exoneration in real time. If you're a true crime fan, it's absolutely not to be missed. Paul Ryder himself watched the trailer for this series just before he passed away and vowed to support the efforts to exonerate Matthew. On a totally different note, we've got a podcast about online dating called Accidentally MILF Online Dating Adventures After 50 with Angel Bliss. The podcast has already won nine awards and if you listen to it, you'll understand why. Oh my goodness, the scrapes and the stories that are told in this podcast are absolutely hilarious. It is brilliant fun and is highly, highly recommended. And another one we recommend you check out is called Soul Bear Sessions, Where Mama At, which is the incredible true life story of Terence Holloway. He spent his childhood on the run from a drug gang with his mum. He ended up becoming a rap star and then many years later discovered that his mother was homeless on the streets of Los Angeles. So he made himself homeless in a bid to try and find her. Really incredible story. Definitely recommend you check that one out. So tell me about the very, the very first incarnation of, of the band. Like, what kind of music were you into at the time when you were about to form the Mondays? What were you listening to? Oh, I suppose the current stuff was Back to the Bunnyman. Echo and the Bunnyman, New Order. Um, I really liked Orange Juice. Remember them? Mm -hmm. Yeah, Love Orange them. Juice. Loved yeah. all that uh, postcard record label stuff. I had a nice big collection of postcard uh, records. I remember you telling me a story about seeing David Bowie on Top of the Pops. Oh, yeah. Do you know, I've read recently, I know about five other people that saw that clip of Top of the Pops when I was eight years old. Tell me about and it. And it changed their life. One of them was Will Sargent from The Bunnyman. He was talking in an interview about the same time and the same show as I was watching when I was eight years old. I always had Top of the Pops on on Thursdays. Um... So it must have been a Thursday night, eight years old, and David Bowie comes on doing Starman with a big blue acoustic guitar. I'd never seen a blue guitar before in my life. And then he looked like he'd stepped out of another world. And it was like my life changed at that moment. How? I wanted to know where he was from and how he got on top of the pops and did he write the song? And I was, I was just curious. And what did it make you feel like? What did it make you think that you needed to do? That I wanted to do something like that. Right, so you wanted to be a pop star. If, or he's more than a pop star, isn't he? I just wanted to be on top of the pops, I think. Hey, but you achieved that, didn't you? Of course I did, yeah. <laughs> yeah, I wanted to be on top of the pops, like David Bowie doing Starman. Yeah. You know, it was a big impact at eight years old seeing that. Yeah. You know, he's like, like I say, it's like he'd come from another world. So at that point you would be at primary school. Yeah. yeah. So what? Tell me about primary school. What that was like. Primary. School. You know, my all my school days were like. I only went for the social aspect. <laughs> Carl Williams was Paul's best friend in primary school. Well, he was a good-looking kid, you see. So I I never had a girlfriend at school. <laughs> but Paul had a girlfriend all the time. All the girls was after him. So. I used to go to their houses with him, you know, as a, a mate, just to like, and so yeah, he always had the girls after him, I always, I always had a girlfriend, you know, he was like, the, he had the olive skin, he was a good looking one, you see. Paul's mum actually taught at Paul and Sean's primary school. 
they were as different as chalk and cheese but they were very very close when they were little funnily enough oh, that Sandra come and say hello to Angela I'm in the front room Oh, Say hello to Angela. Well, you said you as well. No, I'm being interviewed. The year I took Paul to school with me, um, Sean was starting school, and it got to dinner time, and I said, "Right, I've got to go in the staff room now, but will you go outside and play with the other children? No, we'll wait at the door for you." And there was square tiles on the floor. And we stood holding hands in these square tiles. And I said, well, I'm going in the staff room to have my lunch. We'll wait here. And they never budged. They were still stood on the same tiles holding hands three quarters of an hour later when I got back. Mm. I wasn't really into learning stuff, you know, although, you know, I learned to read and write. But um, I was just more about enjoying the day with my mates at school. Mm -hmm. I hated mathematics, hated stuff like that. wasn't very academic. He was never confident. He was always... Veronica used to say, as a young child, the trouble with your Paul, he just does enough to keep his head. He was a very clever lad, but she said, he just does enough to keep his head above the water. Linda's been friends with Sandra for more than 30 years and Sandra also happens to be the mum of Gaz Whelan, the Monday's drummer. Hey, me and Linda could write a book about these tours, couldn't we? Oh, definitely. Oh, hey. book, book. Okay, well, tell now. me, tell no, me. No, we can't say anything now. It's all so oh, do you remember Birmingham? I was on Friday night, stay as on Friday yeah, night. Yeah, but do you remember Birmingham? Oh, oh we nearly died, <laughs> literally. <laughs> No, but I always said to you that you're very bright and very intelligent, but you, you've just not had a great education. That's my take on you. Like you've got the you've got the basics in like you've you've got that basic intelligence and, yeah, and yeah. sense of humour, but you obviously didn't really you, you didn't go to school though from being about fourteen, did you? No, I had a job. So when I was thirteen, that's when I started wagging school. Wagging school is like. Um, skipping school mm -hmm. and uh, it was one afternoon three of us I think it was Paddy Newman and Patrick O'Reilly and me went to Manchester on a bus instead of going to school and I went round all the shops clothes shops asking if they had Saturday jobs and I got one in this really good clothes shop round the corner from the shop that I really wanted to work in because that had all the cool real cool stuff in called Gans Gear and I got, a, I got a job round the corner from that. So at 13, I, was, I had this Saturday job. By the time I was 14, I wasn't going into school much. I was going working. Did your mum know? No, nobody <gasps> knew. Really? Yeah. Did she not yeah. wonder where you were getting all your money from? No, and the clothes. I was on a scam with the clothes. <laughs> it was quite easy to um, hide stuff round the back of the shop and go back for it after the shop had closed. Oh. And I was selling, and when I did go in school, I had a big bag of clothes to sell. Oh, wow. So, you're um, admitting to a criminal offence there, you do realise that. I think it's uh, way past. Is it the stuff of urban legend? Urban legend, yeah. yeah. None, of, none of this is true. Yeah, instead of going to school, I was going to work. Yeah. We were in this hotel, and we could see the arena over there, <laughs> and we were here. And there was this great big hedge and we were going to have to walk oh. all the way around. Yeah. So we decided we'd climb this hedge. Well, you know, we can't do anything. I mean, we're going back a long time, but we weren't very athletic then. No, we but really. we were a lot more agile. Oh, yeah. So we're climbing the hedge and we got on top with our legs over each side. I was the best salesman on Saturday. I won every week. Every week I got the best salesman. Uh, and what was the trick? How the did trick you... was not to pester them, just to give them space. Really? Yeah. And did you flatter them and tell them things look good even if they didn't? Oh, yeah. You would? Yeah, of course I would. <laughs> well, even if it didn't look nice, you would say, oh, that looks really great on you. I, I would say it looks great. 
Really? Yeah, that's, that's all I got sales. <laughs> but the trick is, Dr. Courtman say, can I help you? Can I help you? Can I help you? Can I get, get your disc? Just say, I'm here if you need any help. And right. give them space. And, and they'll I, always come. I believe you didn't ever really come home with much money, though. Is that right? No, I usually spent it on clothes. Yeah. Got a, I got paid in one hand and gave it back in the other hand. And then took loads but, of clothes out. But I did get lots of clothes. Yeah. When we realised if we'd have dropped, mm. we'd have been right inside a dam. It yes. was a we massive stupid. big lake. We were stupid, being clever, taking a short one, so, like, yeah. yeah. So yeah, we had stupid. to get our leg over quick and get back down. Oh, you did, definitely. <laughs> yeah. And get back down and walk round. I've been doing this nearly 40 years. Wow. About 38 years. And you're school. at the same high school as Sean? Yeah. Yes, he was uh, three years above me at school. So yeah. when I was a little first year, he was already a big third year. Right. You know, and there's... Ooh. When you're young like that, there's a big age difference. Right. How was it growing up up until the point you were at high school? What was your relationship with him like with up John? until age 11? Yeah. Pretty good. Um, although, he, you know, he was a bit of a bully. Um, I've said that before. You know, I used to, I used to suffer from asthma and he'd sit on my chest till I turned blue. Really? You know? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> That nice. type of thing. Nice, nice brother. But, you know, it's like, we got on great. We got on great unless he had a, unless he was being a bully. But, oh, I should have seen the state of it, yeah. So we were there, oh. and then we were watching the gig at the arena, and then all of a sudden I said to you, oh, it's raining in. Yeah. And it wasn't raining in. It was something very nasty. Yeah. What? Well, we were down below, and it's somebody up above. Couldn't be bothered going to the toilet. Go to the toilet. Oh, we had to get out of the way quick, didn't we? Yeah. What kind of things did you do when you were getting on great, like? Probably playing records. Really? Yeah. We always got records on a Saturday afternoon with our spans. So I'd be back home and playing records. We'd go round to my Auntie Mary's house, where Matt and Pat Carroll lived. Um, they're the designers that they, designed all the iconic Mondays covers. Yeah, the central station design is Matt, Pat and Karen. Uh, but we'd go around to their house with our records and they'd play their records. So it was like, okay. it was a record fest. We'll be back really soon after these quick messages from our sponsors. Isn't it great when you get together with friends and family that you haven't seen for a long time? Well, I know the perfect spot if you're looking for somewhere to gather with your friends or family to celebrate a birthday or an anniversary or just getting together for the sake of it. It's a beautiful chateau in rural France. It's got an outdoor heated pool and five acres of grounds to get lost in. It's on the edge of a pretty little village and just 15 minutes from the coast. It sleeps up to 26 people. It has 11 bedrooms, nine bathrooms, five living rooms, three kitchens, five acres of grounds and that beautiful heated pool. It's two and a half hours to London or two and a half hours to Paris on the edge of a forest in the pretty rural village of Groncourt in Normandy. Weekends start from as little as £40 per person per night. Find out more details at francechateauforrent.com That's francechateauforrent.com for your next big family and friends gathering. And it also happens to be the place where Paul Ryder himself once lived. Au revoir, mes amis. And who, who, what were these records? Which ones? Oh, definitely lots of Bowie, Roxy Music. Um, I'm sure I had a status quo record as well somewhere. <laughs> Which one? Uh, Caroline. Really? Yeah, I bought that with my spends. The sweet, I was sweet, the sweet. Yeah, Donny sweet. Osmond, David Cassidy, you wouldn't have liked wouldn't them, have would had you? Donny and David, no. no. <laughs> definitely the sweet. Um, Slade. Oh, yeah. Definitely had some Slade. And you could buy these um, Top of the Pops albums. Oh, 
Oh, yeah, from... with the like, snide artists. Yeah, yeah, they the really colour versions. Oh, well, they were terrible, but they were so cheap. Yeah. You get them at Woolworths. Get them at Woolworths. They were 79 was... pence, weren't they? You, we got the same one, I think. Yeah. Yeah. They, they had loads Got of it them. home and put it on and thought, there's something Doesn't wrong with this song. Right. <laughs> Then worked out it was cover versions. Do you remember that they then started doing 20 Fantastic Hits by the original artist? Yes. Volume 1, 2. I've, I've got volumes 2 and 3 of oh. those. That was my introduction to music. Same era. What as year you. was that then? Uh, I would have been about 11, so you would have been about 9, nine maybe. Yeah. Yeah. Nine. yeah. That's, that's and about it was right. like T Rex, the sweet. Mm hmm. Slave. I was into Fleetwood Mac around that time. Oh my time. god, he was into Fleetwood yeah, Mac. Yeah, that that album is phenomenal. I can't, what's it called? What's that album called? Rumours. Rumours oh, by no, Fleetwood that, Mac. That was later than. No, it wasn't. I got that when I was at school. Oh. Yeah. Okay. Brilliant album. So, what would you? What music would you say influenced you in terms of? Oh, I want to be like them, or I want to be as good as them, or what about you? You've, you've not mentioned funk. Funk came a bit later. Um, disco as well. Di it was the whole disco era. Disco, disco and punk, and good funk came around at the same time of probably seventy six. Yes, yeah, definitely mm -hmm. seventy six. Especially in New York, where the punk scene was kind of born at the same time as disco. Mm -hmm. You know, people was either you're a punk or you're into disco. Mm -hmm one or the other but i was into both i was into music no matter what it was in the house that we lived in then it had warm air central heating and there was like ducks in the wall with vents and the two of them whenever they didn't want me and derek to listen to what they were saying they'd give each other the nod and go upstairs but what they didn't realize when they were talking, it acted as a, tin a tannoy and we could hear it coming out of the heating vents, every word that they said. Well, this particular day, Paul came in with something under his arm and Sean said, what's he got? I said, I don't know. Anyway, we soon found out. He bought, because in his bedroom, Derek had built this unit for him and he had his hi-fi and his stereo and his speakers and his woofers and tweeters or whatever you called them, all set up. What about Motown as well? Motown, yeah. Um, that goes back to going back round to my Auntie Mary's and um, they had a collection of Motown singles. Marvin Gaye. Oh, yeah, Marvin Gaye, Temptations, yeah. Marvin Gaye. You said that the very first time I interviewed you, you said you were into the Temptations. Temptation. That was in 1991. <laughs> and you also said that you listened to Lionel Richie on Radio 1. Do you remember when a child is born? No, not, Ryan, not, not Lionel. It was... All these years I've thought that was Lionel Richie. Google it. All right, hang on. What's his name? Let's see if I can beat Google. Johnny Mathis. I'm, I'm going to admit I actually bought When a Child is Born. Nice song. It's a good song. It's, it's a really the test of time every Christmas. Yeah. So this particular day had not been upstairs long when we heard this music and we heard Her Child is Born and it was Johnny Mathis. He bought the record because he liked him but he didn't want us to laugh at him. And he was singing along with Johnny Mathis. But what he didn't realise, it was booming out of the central heating system. So tell me about high school. You, you were in two years below Sean. So was it kind of uncool for him to hang out with you because you were too young? Yeah, by, a t by the time I got to secondary school, Sean had gone into the... The, whole, the other half of the school, so we were separated. We didn't see each other at playgrounds or dinner because he was older. So I didn't really see much of him at school. I did get quite a few times off teachers. Oh, so you're Sean Ryder's brother, are you? He kind of made a name for himself as being the class clown. He was very funny. Yeah. He was a very funny class clown. And what did people expect from you as a result of that? Probably to be as boisterous as him but I'm very quiet compared to um, Sean. Yeah, I mean, you're two completely different personalities, aren't you? Just tell yeah. us a bit more about the differences between the two of you. He's very outspoken. He's very narcissistic. It's all about Sean, Sean, Sean. 
Um, and I think people thought I was going to be much more like that at school. Yeah. You know, but they soon discovered I was the quiet one. Yeah. Yeah. So what, did you share the same friend group outside of school? Only only cousins. We'd, we'd always go around to cousins at the same time. But he had his friends, I had my friends. You know. And the two didn't mix? No, no, because when, you, when you're that age, that three-year age gap is massive. It wasn't three years, it's 19 months. 19 months, between you. two it's years. only a year and a half. Oh, yeah, still a big difference. But it's two school years, two so that's pretty years. huge, isn't it? Yeah, yeah. yeah. So now I had, I had my own mates, he had his mates, and we didn't really... Uh, we didn't really mix. I asked Gaz Whelan, the drummer with the Mondays, what he thought about how different the brothers were. No, they are different, but they're also very similar. It's like me and Paul are very, very different, but really similar. I mean, you know, literally, I know that this sounds really cheesy and cliche, but we could almost read each other's minds. We'd finish each other's sentences and I'd know what he was thinking. He'd know what I was thinking. He'd say things to each other burst out laughing. So... Uh, and he was, I, I know that sounds, this sounds really cliche and it sounds, you know, because he's gone now and all that, but he was like a brother to me. He was like an old, I didn't have an older brother and older sister, so he was like an older brother to me. He really was. Do you think that if there hadn't been that sibling rivalry, that the Mondays would have had many more albums and been more productive and had more output? Ooh, that's a good question. Uh, there's a m many number of things why we didn't, you know, we all blame each other and we all, we were all to blame, every one of us. I'd like to like to talk more about it because it's, it's been quite cathartic, that. I feel, uh, I... just got a shiver down my spine there, he's fucking here, isn't he? Yeah, of course he is. Oh, oh, just got all really cold shivers, oh, that's fucking weird. Really? Oh, oh, it's boiling in here. Okay. Honestly, I'm not, oh, that is fucking weird. Oh, it's not going either. Oh, that's not going. Oh, oh, that's very strange. Oh, fucking hell, my heart's going down. Oh, that's very weird. You know, you get cold shivers, they last for like five seconds. Yeah. Oh, that's very weird that my heart's going now. That's fucking weird, that. That was very weird. Okay, now, right, I'm going to go. I need a pint. All right, thanks, Gaz. Don't speak again, please, oh, Andrew. Don't speak again. I want to speak again. Those more anecdotes and things about I want to speak about him a bit more. So that's it for this episode. Please join us again next time. There's a moment in the next episode that sends a shiver down my spine every time I hear it. Just have a listen to this. He's your only brother. He's your only sibling. Mm -hmm. And you were very close when you were growing up. It yeah. must hurt you that you don't have a relationship with him now. Um, I just and don't... It helps because I don't like the person he became. Right. I don't like who he is. Do you hope that one day you'll reconcile and be friends again? Yeah, I'm sure it'll happen one day. Yeah. Yeah. How do you think he would feel if he got a call one day saying that you were dead? Doesn't that just send a shiver down your spine? I can't believe I asked that question. Uh, please join us next time and you'll find out what he said. Please don't forget to like and share the podcast and spread the word about it. It's really what Paul would have wanted. Thank you so much for listening. Please go to our website, which is paulrider.tv. There you'll find links to all of our social media. Join in the discussion on Facebook. And also you can pre-order his book and buy his music. So it's like a one-stop shop for everything. And speaking of music, we're going to play you a bit of his music at the end of every episode. This is one one of my favourite big arm tracks. It's called Sun Rays. Thanks again for listening. We will be back with loads more in the next episode. See you then. Bye. This project was brought to you by the fab team at Glistening Productions. Cameras were by Richard Venti and Phil Smethers. Offline editing was by Phil Smethers, Richard Hayward, Terence Holloway and Richard Venti. Online editing by Richard Hayward. Titles were by Matt Carroll from Central Station. Music, of course, by Paul Ryder and Big Arm. The associate producer was Sarah Walters. And it was produced and directed by Angela Smith. The executive producers are Angela Smith and M. Jacoby. And special thanks must go to Linda Ryder, Sandra Whelan, Gary Whelan and Carl Williams. But also, of course, to the late, great star of the show, Paul Ryder. I'll send for you in nine days' time I'll be 
your dog And you can be my sunset No stopping me now I'm on the move G next though when we were on the stage and it started moving. Oh yeah, that was frightening. Yeah. 